Well, my disclosure is that I'm employed by AWS. As simple as that. I have moved over from the academic world over to the vendor world. Uh, it's been really interesting to see uh, probably about 30 to 40% of the CMIOs who I knew when I was a CMIO at Seattle Children's who used to answer my emails like this. Somehow I get into their spam folder now, and I don't get, get answered as quickly. But I am going to talk a little bit about uh, the journey, and I'm actually going to go even further back uh, before I was a CMIO. Uh, but I'll start a little bit with what I do every day. These are three headlines that I saw just in the last week, and we're all familiar with this. We know that uh, people are leaving healthcare. Uh, actually, you know, healthcare workforce lost over 330,000 people in 2021. I guess I was one of those. I, I moved over in 2021 to AWS. Uh, and certainly financially, this has been a really tough year. But at the same time, we still have lots of people really doing the right thing and, and trying to make healthcare better. But when I get up in the morning, I think when all of us get up in the morning, this is what we think about. Uh, when we look at the Commonwealth Fund and, and when they look at outcomes as compared to expenditures in healthcare, you want to be sort of in the upper left. You want to have lower spending and higher outcomes. We are unfortunately in the lower right as compared to a lot of these countries. And so when I think about what I'm doing uh, and what I'm trying to do to help all of, uh, it, it's been strange starting to use the word customers, but when I start thinking about what I do to help my customers, it's really around this. So with that, I'm gonna take a journey way, way, way back, and I'm gonna take you back to 2001. How many people are old enough to recognize this thing? A few of you are old enough to recognize the Palm Pilot. So I was a, Mike was mentioning, I was at the other UW, UW, they call it in, in Wisconsin. I was a pediatric resident, and we were on a rotation where uh, we were taking care of a lot of the post-op kids. And the way we did it was they had these pre-printed paper order sets uh, where we wrote the orders for the kids post-op. But the problem was it was static. There was no decision support in there. There was no uh, advisory content or anything like that. So we did the simple thing of taking those order sets, transcribing them, making an electronic file, and then putting in some notes uh, advising uh, the residents of when to do certain things and put it on the Palm Pilot. That was my introduction to informatics. And it went pretty well. And uh, from there, uh, we expanded a little bit. And then I ended up going to Pittsburgh to do my pediatric critical care fellowship. And in 2002, uh, I was a second year PICU fellow at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. And we implemented the Cerner CPOE system in 2002. This was the single most read article in pediatrics in 2005 in the country. Uh, and uh, I'm not on the citation list, but I was the fellow entering the orders electronically during this go live, and it didn't go well. Uh, and it says unexpected increased mortality after implementation. What it should say is unexpected increased mortality after a poor implementation of CPOE. Ironically, the counterpoint article to this article was written by Seattle Children's Hospital, where Seattle Children's showed a good implementation of CPOE, actually didn't result in any of this. So this was sort of the claim to fame and got me really interested in informatics, got me interested in what was it about our implementation that made this a poor implementation. And so uh, when I moved into informatics, this is sort of what we do. Uh, it is. We're essentially interpreters. We're translators between the clinical and the technical. So with that, that area of interest, I moved from Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, went to Children's Hospital of Minnesota, got my first real job as a pediatric critical care doc. And about three years later, they were looking for a CMIO, still in the early days of what a CMIO was. And my interview essentially consisted of, I can tell you exactly how not to do things, because we did everything wrong in Pittsburgh. Uh, and here's how you do it. So they said, sure, we'll take a chance on this very green, uh, relatively new out of fellowship person. And ended up uh, doing some really cool stuff there, implemented CPOE there in Minnesota, implemented some other electronic systems, got really interested in medication safety and decision support and, uh, and efficiency and things like that. And then eventually in 2015, I was recruited to Seattle Children's by the then CMIO uh, who was a good friend of mine. He recruited me as the associate CMIO, as well as a medical director for med safety. And I ended up doing, again, some cool stuff here. And over that time, uh, as I went on, 
I can sort of think back to really two themes or two events that got me thinking about potentially switching careers again. So the first one was I would go to these meetings of CIOs and CMIOs across children's hospitals and we would sit around a table and usually the first thing we did on the first day was we'd all be sitting around the table and you'd take five minutes to talk about what you were working on. I'm sure within lab medicine it's similar. You go to these conferences and you sit down and say, here's our big issues, here's what we're working on. And what I found was you get to about the fourth or fifth person and you realize you're exactly, you're working on exactly the same stuff. You're all in your own little silo, in your own little place, but you're doing the same stuff in isolation. There may be some collaboration there, but really you're doing the same things. And this was frustrating to me that I was doing the same thing as they were doing in Boston and they're doing the same thing as they're doing in Houston. Uh, we're not pooling resources at all. We're not sharing data at all. Uh, we're all doing the same thing. So it wasn't very efficient. So that got a bit frustrating. At the same time, <clears throat> I, I had a couple of cases uh, here at Seattle Children's that sort of uh, made me think a little bit bigger. So I'm going to walk you through uh, a case that I had about three years ago. So we had a patient, a teenager with an autoimmune disease who came in and uh, she was in the ICU for various reasons and over the, a couple of day uh, time period we saw certain things in her. We saw that she would develop some lower blood pressures and we would talk about it and say well you know she's got all these gauzes on her and so she's got this the cuff over the gauze and so it's probably low because of that and then it would get better the blood pressure would go back up. And then uh, for some reason, her urine output would go down, and we, we explained it away, saying that she had uh, a lot of third spacing losses and things like that, and so we'd give her a little bit of fluid, and then the urine output would uh, come back up again. And then we would come in, and she would have some lower temperatures again, because maybe the room was not adjusted right. Uh, she had gauzes all over the place. She had a lot of weeping sores, and so uh, thought that it was that. We would turn the temperature in the room a little bit up again, and then her temperature would come back up, and then it would go up a little bit more. Uh, and then, you know, you'd come in and her heart rate would be elevated <clears throat> and everything else seemed to, would seem to be okay. And we would say, well, she's in pain, certainly, because of all these things on her skin. She's uncomfortable. So we'd give her a little bit more pain medicine, maybe give her a little bit of fluid and the heart rate would go down. And then we would come in and uh, she would be sort of sleepy and it would be difficult to wake her up. And we would uh, talk about it and say, well, she's on sedatives because she's got all these sores and is in a lot of pain. So she's on a continuous sedation medicine. So that's why her mental status isn't what it should be. And then we would back off on the sedation a little bit and her mental status would come back up. So this happened over the next couple of days. And, um, and we're trying to absorb all of these things in addition to all of the notes and in addition to all of the other vital signs and all of the other results, tons of labs were coming back, our waveform data, x-rays, uh, all the interactions with everybody and then you multiply that times uh, all of the patients we're taking, it's a lot of data. There was an article that came out of Mayo a few years ago uh, and so, uh, and they looked at this. <clears throat> Does anybody know roughly how many data points the average critical care physician absorbs in a day when they're on service? Yell it out. How many data points? 2,000. Keep going. 10,000. Keep going. It's actually 50,000. 50,000 data points for the average critical care physician in a given day based on a full service of patients. How many of those 50,000 are needed to make most patient care decisions? Five hundred. Two hundred. Keep going. It's actually about 60. So of the 50,000 data points, only about 60 are needed to make, make most decisions. And so we were weeding through all of these data points, trying to pick out the ones that really mattered. And in the end, if you look at this, if you look at just the ones here that are in blue, what does high heart rate, low urine output, elevated temperature, low mental status, low blood pressure scream at you? Sepsis. This is sepsis. This is clearly sepsis. But in the grand scheme of everything else going on, it sort of got lost in it, and the, the girl ended up on ECMO. 
And so as I started thinking about this, I thought it was 2018 maybe, uh, 2019, thinking, okay, it's 2018, it's 2019. Medicine has clearly exceeded the capacity of the human brain. So what can we do using technology to help a situation like this not arise? So I thought, well, there must be an algorithm out there that could tell us this patient is septic. And you know what? There is. Uh, th there is an algorithm that uh, comes with a standard electronic health record implementation, and you just plug it in. Unfortunately, when one healthcare organ one academic medical center implemented this standard sepsis algorithm, they found it didn't do very well. Too many alerts, too many missed patients. And why is that? Well, what it what wasn't realized, and they've actually recently talked about this and, and changed their approach, was you can't just plug in a, medic, uh, a machine learning algorithm, take it from one place, plug it into another place. There's too many variables. <clears throat> so you have to be a little bit more nuanced, nuanced a little bit careful about how you do this. So those two things sort of gave me the impetus to say, you know what, I'm almost 50 years old. I think it's time to do something a little bit different. And so I got recruited to AWS by a former Seattle Children's uh, colleague who was also at AWS. And I joined the academic medicine team. Now the first thing I'm gonna talk about is, who do I actually work for? Because the minute I did this, I got two reactions. First, uh, my son asked me, does that mean you can get us a discount on Prime? Or does that mean that you can get us our packages more quickly? So no, because I don't work for Amazon, I actually work for AWS. And AWS is simply the cloud provider for Amazon. So when you go on and download a Prime movie that is housed on AWS. Uh, similarly, if you go home tonight and you watch Netflix, that is housed on AWS. So that's who I work for. I work for a the uh, Amazon Web Services, which is the cloud vendor uh, of, of Amazon. But what do I do? I actually do exactly the same thing that I used to do at Seattle Children's but I just happen to do it across organizations, and I do it with some new and kind of cool tools. But in the end, we go back to that Commonwealth Fund uh, uh, screen. What I do and why I do it is exactly the same. A bunch of years ago, the IHI came out with the triple aim, which was essentially improve care, reduce cost, and uh, take care of the patients in the process. In the process, with all of the things that we've seen around clinician burnout, they've changed it to now the quadruple aim, which is that plus sort of a clinician wellness or clinician experience piece of it. And even recently, people have talked about the fifth part of the quadruple aim, the quintuple aim, which is health equity. But really, when I do this on a daily basis, uh, I really look at how do I, with all of the tools that I have at my expo uh, 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 disposal, with all the relationships that we create, try to affect the quadruple aim. Any questions at all about, so far, how I got to where I am today? Because what I'm going to do now is talk about four lessons that I've learned in my 17 months or so at AWS. Any questions in the audience or any questions in the, on, the, on the Zoom? And there will certainly be questions at the end, uh, or room for questions at the end. Okay. Well, let's go through these four lessons. The, the first thing is uh, I was amazed, and I've worked for three different healthcare organizations uh, in my life, and my process of going over to AWS was the single most rigorous pre-employment and employment process I've ever been through. Um, I think in healthcare we have a lot of lessons that we can learn for, from how uh, employees are, are onboarded, are recruited, are interviewed, are offered jobs or not offered jobs uh, at a company like Amazon. When I was preparing for my interview at Amazon, I knew exactly what questions they were going to answer, ask me. You can go online and type in Amazon interview questions. They're all there. It's not a secret. Uh, it, it's, it's public knowledge that you'll be asked one of these questions. Because essentially, uh, Amazon has these used to be 14, now 16 leadership principles, and what they want to do is ask you, tell me about a time in your life, in your career, where you've exhibited this leadership principle. Tell me about a time when you disagreed with your boss. Tell me about a time when you took ownership of something that wasn't yours, those kinds of things. And so I prepared 
probably for about 20 to 25 hours from my interview, uh, I had a 60 page document of essentially my whole career uh, and examples of how I exhibited those things. I then interviewed with five different people, uh, something called a loop, uh, where you go through an interview individually with these five people in, alone in a room or virtually. But then what I didn't really know until now is that <clears throat> after you interview, you find each of the people who interview you are in charge of two or three leadership principles. And they report whether you exhibit those leadership principles and not just exhibit them, but actually raise the bar. They want any new hire to raise the bar compared to everybody else there. If you don't raise the bar from the current employer, they won't hire you. So most people who interview at Amazon don't get hired. My job uh, was the 16th application I put in at Amazon. Uh, it took that many tries <laughs> to even get past the phone screen. But once you're hired, it's significant. Uh, it, they will now own, you know, they sort of own the onboarding process. They, they value you. Uh, I remember when I was, whether it was in Pittsburgh or in Madison or in Minneapolis or here at Seattle Children's, what is typical for healthcare? The thing that takes the longest when you get hired is probably your licensing. That's brutal because it's a state process. But once you've gotten that, generally what happens is you show up on the morning of, uh, you do a few little accreditation things. You maybe do a little bit an hour or two of training or something like that, and then you're just thrown to the wolves. Uh, even you know, the, the most clinically uh, oriented specialties, maybe you get two or three hours of EHR training. Maybe you get to learn how to use a couple things, and then you're seeing patients because that's where the money comes from. The day I joined AWS, uh, I was given this thing. It's called an Embark Plan. Uh, and it was prepared for me by my boss. Uh, and it's on a hyperlink on my browser that I still have access to. It's 17 months later, I still have access to it. And you can see down here, I had 143 tasks to complete in my first three months. And that's all I had to do in my first three months. I, I was kind of allowed to talk to healthcare organizations, but I wasn't, in, uh, I wasn't forced to do it. They said, your job in the first three months is to get to know us as a company because we anticipate you being here for a long time. We're gonna invest in you as a person uh, invest in you in your training, and, and that's really your priority. So by day one, week one, week two, month one, I had specific things I had to complete. I was given a list of 35 people I had to meet and links with a single click to set up a meeting with them. So I had 35 30 minute meetings in my first week with people who were predetermined for me that I should meet. I didn't have to do any of that stuff. The other thing was, uh, it was the first time in a long time that intellectually, I was uncomfortable. I was, uh, even though I am a sort of, I'm a physician who is sort of in a salesy role, I'm not very technical at all. I'm not building things. I'm, I'm mostly encouraging people to, uh, to help uh, to do build things, but people who actually build are, are solutions architects. That said, I was required to learn topics that I never knew about. So here's, I, this is the very first thing. Day one, I was told, this is what a cloud is. You know, cl yes, a cloud is where Netflix is hosted, or yes, a cloud is where the NFL does its statistics to tell you what the past completion percentage likelihood is. But in the end, this is the definition of cloud, and everything goes from here. And this is what we do on a daily basis, is we use this thing called cloud. When, when, when Mike and I would argue back in 2017 about how far back do we take lab data and store it, uh, to have it available uh, when switching from Cerner to Epic, all of that data going back five or 10 years, stored in the cloud. It's not stored on a server uh, here at UW or at Seattle Children's in, a, in some little room, it's stored in the cloud. That's what we do on a daily basis. But with this sort of baseline definition, and the key things here are it's on demand. It's, it's, you don't pay for Netflix 24 seven, you use Netflix when you wanna use Netflix. Um, and if you have, if you need storage for 10,000 patients, you pay for storage for 10,000 patients. Whereas traditionally you paid for storage for 100,000 patients because you might grow to 100,000 patients. That's different. But the thing where, where I was really sort of thrown back was I had to learn this before my three months were up. This is every service at AWS. You don't have to learn this. This won't be on the test. But we were asked to learn all of this 
before the three months were up, and then we actually take an exam. Uh, it's called a cloud practitioner certification. Uh, even though I'm a salesy person, even though I'm a physician, I had to learn this and take a test, and if I didn't pass it, I couldn't work. I had to go back and study again and pass it again. So before I'm allowed to do the equivalent of seeing patients, I had to take this test. When we were rolling out uh, Epic, this was a really interesting topic of, should, do we have to require physicians and nurses to pass a test? And pass a test like this before they can use the system? A lot of people felt we shouldn't, and the bar was actually set pretty low. Here at AWS, if you don't pass this test, you go back to study, and then you uh, come back and uh, look at it again. Similarly, this is the machine learning stack at AWS. We had to learn this, uh, because this is the kind of stuff, and even though I don't have to explain to you exactly what the difference is between uh, recognition and text we do have to know that because when we start talking about uh, how we can help, I need to know what's available to have those conversations. So that was lesson number one is the onboarding process was prodigious, uh, but it was helpful and it not only was helpful intellectually, but it really prepared me to hit the ground running in that month, that third month. And I think we can learn a lot in healthcare, especially as we start seeing struggles with retaining people uh, within healthcare. Uh, if people feel like they have been invested in, I think it'll make a big difference. Lesson number two, uh, and I've been here uh, at AWS for 16 months now, uh, <clears throat> we actually have a lot of things that we can do to help. And we were talking a little bit earlier about potential projects that we could do, uh, but we have a lot of resources that are available and we can help. But what I have found is I can no longer be a champion for a healthcare organization's projects or needs or things like that. It has to be somebody local. Uh, getting data is really difficult. Not technically difficult, but it's, uh, it's difficult from a quality standpoint. It's difficult from a governance standpoint. There's a project I'm doing with a, uh, an academic medical center in Southern California where they want to build a machine learning model to predict a specific complication. Uh, we've sort of, we at AWS have been sort of twiddling our thumbs for about six weeks now. Everybody's at the ready. We've got data scientists, we've got solution architects, we've got the, the uh, credits, all this stuff like that ready. They can't get data because they've got to get in line to get their data. And that's, that's tough because how many patients have, are potentially suffering those, uh, those adverse effects while we wait? But the cool thing that I've learned is, and this is something, you know, there's a couple takeaways that I would love for you to take home about what, what AWS does. This is a book that I actually read before I joined AWS, uh, but it's really true. The way we do things at AWS is a little bit, we, I think, I don't remember what the word is, but it's kind of goofy. Let's say that um, Mike has a, a project that he wants to do. You want to solve for some problem. In most places, you sort of get down, you start brainstorming, and you start to think about what solutions you might be able to use to address that problem and things like that. The way we do things at Amazon is a little different. We truly do work backwards. And the way we work backwards is we announce in a press release format the go live of the solution a year in the future. And so I'll give you an example. I'm working on a project where we're using machine learning to process patient safety reports. And we're crawling the text, the free text, and we're using um, uh, natural language processing to find individual medications that were in the text. So what I wrote up was an announcement that says, today AWS and the University of so-and-so are announcing the release of the patient safety accelerator, which does this and this and this and this, and by doing this, it'll solve this problem. And then, once we've got that, then we actually start working backwards towards what are the solutions that we need? Who needs to be involved? What's a true timeline? What's it going to cost? You know, what are, and then you have a, a couple of pages of frequently asked questions. Of what are the patients going to ask about this? What are the staff going to ask about this? Uh, and you try to be pretty candid. So that's the way we uh, do things to try to find the thing that's truly of value to, to our customer. With you know, those sort of things in mind, we start looking at what are the things that we actually need to do? Uh, what, are the things, what are the tools that we need to use? I worked with a critical care doc down in Southern California, 
and he said, I've got this problem. I can't, uh, get, uh, I can't get data out of our electronic health record to make a critical care decision quickly. So I need a machine learning model. And we started talking to him, and it turned out he doesn't need machine learning. He actually doesn't even need AI. He just needs a dashboard. But by working backwards, we started really looking at what are the things that you need. So I've, I've had to learn some of these things, you know, the difference between AI and, and machine learning. And, and, and uh, machine learning is a type of AI, but not all AI is machine learning. A type of machine learning is natural language processing. And so as, uh, if, if, if you go home and ask Alexa to do something, Alexa is an AI that actually has uh, machine learning embedded in there. So we've had to learn the differences because sometimes you end up going down the wrong road uh, of things like that. But natural language processing, we have a really cool medical natural language processing tool that can pick out diagnoses, medications, lab results, and put them in a timeline. And we use it to de-identify data. Uh, it's pretty cool. So the next lesson I, I've learned in uh, I never really knew this until I've actually crossed over. I, I sort of was used to the pace in academic medicine when I was there, but now actually I've come to, uh, to AWS. And as Mike was crawling uh, my, my LinkedIn profile and he was looking at my various certifications, he probably didn't look all the way to the bottom. I think as of about a year ago, I got my winemaking certificate from UC Davis. Uh, that took about two years of, of offline or online classes. So I had to put a wine reference in here. But, but when you pour a bottle of wine, uh, you can pour it as fast as you want, but that sort of shoulder there is what's going to limit how fast the wine can pour. And what I have started to notice, it sort of goes to that, that data discussion that we had, uh, which is <clears throat> in, in tech, in industry, we generally will move as fast as you want to move. We usually want to move faster than you want to move or that you, than you can move. Uh, and it, we're, we're used to moving really quickly. We're used to going uh, at a scale or a speed that I had never been exposed to but when I was in a healthcare organization. And so as you interact with whether it be us or other companies, you'll find that uh, they will move fast if you want to move fast. And what I always try to do is, is encourage people to plan as much as possible so that we can move quickly. Uh, the, I remember when I joined Seattle Children's in 2007, I was told, whatever, uh, whatever the vendor says for a timeline, multiply it times three. That's what we typically do at Seattle Children's. That's what I was told. And it's, it was sort of a joke to me, oh, that's Seattle Children's. It's actually not just Seattle Children's. That is academic medicine as a whole. Uh, for various reasons, whether it be uh, everybody's got to sign off on it, whether it be budgetary, whether it be reporting, whether it be governance, who knows? Things move really slowly. And, uh, it's one of the things that's been tough uh, to get used to on our side because I'm sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. It's like, we're ready. Uh, and oftentimes there's a lot of things that have to happen uh, before it does. And sometimes it feels a little bit like this. It, it, I have regular meetings with CMIOs all the time and CIOs and chief quality officers. And, and I hear these, these things about how, uh, you know, we have this huge problem or even the, the headlines we saw at the very beginning. Uh, about the finances within healthcare, we actually do have solutions to a lot of these things. If there's, a, if there's too much paper, we have a solution to digitize all those things and put it into electronic format. Uh, that, that big stack of solutions that we had at the very uh, beginning, what I learned is about 90% of those came from a customer saying, we need this. And if it didn't exist, we actually created it with that, that customer. I'm, I'm doing a project right now with a, um, one of the UC, University of California schools to create a new product. It doesn't exist right now. It is a huge need in healthcare, but it doesn't exist. And so we're working together to create it. Uh, but, but there has to be, as I mentioned before, the champion and the willingness to risk a little bit, whether it be time, whether it be some investment of data or, or, uh, or expertise to get that started. And typically the way that we do things is <clears throat> we will, uh, we will provide the infrastructure and we will provide the expertise to at least do that first proof of concept to see if it's even going to work. Because we don't want you to invest a ton of money and time in something that's not going to work. But at the same time, we do want you to dip your toes into areas. And so typically what we will do is say, 
okay, you get us some de-identified data, you get us some clinical experts who can advise us on whether we're doing the right thing, we'll do the rest. We'll provide the infrastructure, we'll provide the expertise, we will credit your account so that you don't have to pay for the, 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 the sort of machine learning or, or whatever that's going on in your account, and then we'll see if it works. And then we sort of hit that fork in the road and decide, is it gonna be the next Alexa, or is it gonna be the next Fire Phone? Hopefully it's the Alexa, because that uh, succeeded. Although it's interesting how much we learned from the Fire Phone that actually ended up in the Alexa technology. And then the last thing I want to talk about is just an acknowledgement. Healthcare is hard, especially healthcare in the United States. Uh, if you want to read a really good book, there was, there's an author named Robert Pearl. He used to be the um, head of the Kaiser Permanente Medical Group, and he wrote a book recently called Uncaring, which was pretty controversial because he's a physician, he's a plastic surgeon, uh, but he talks about how much in healthcare that we consider big problems have solutions, but the biggest, the people who are the biggest uh, obstruction to fixing those problems are the people who are affected by those problems. So one of the biggest things we talk about is physician burnout. Huge numbers, 30%, some people say as high as 40, 50%. And there are a lot of things that we can do about it. One of the big, the two biggest things that people say are there's too much paperwork, too much bureaucracy, uh, and then electronic health records. And then when we look at potential uh, regulatory changes to try to fix those things, probably the biggest impediment to that is the AMA. Uh, because the current system actually is really profitable for specialists. And so why would we change it when dermatologists and cardiologists and critical care docs are making such a good living? So it's this weird sort of oxymoron of we want to fix the system, but we're working against ourselves. And certainly in a system whereby we are rewarding doing more things as opposed to preventing things. It's a tough system to argue for some of these things that are hard to see uh, when, it's, uh, when it's down the road. Questions at all about those four lessons? I'm gonna go in a minute through an example of just sort of what we do on a daily basis. But are there any questions uh, for now? Yes. The this probably about the first one. How did you come across this sort of job as a physician? What are the keywords? Uh, well, I mentioned, so the question was, how did I come across this job as a physician? Uh, I, I was lucky in that I had started looking and I had a referral from somebody who already worked at AWS. But what I have found is that uh, a lot, whether it be at startups or big tech, meaning Apple, AWS, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, Google, whatever, uh, you've seen all of these companies sort of in some cases dipping their toes, in some cases jumping into the pool into healthcare. And, but we, what we also know is that if you just purely leave healthcare to technical people, it fails. We've seen that with Google, we've seen that with Microsoft. And so uh, there is a clear acknowledgement from these companies that we need people who have done this. And so uh, you could go into Google right now and type in AWS physician job. Uh, and there's actually a job right now on another team at AWS uh, for a physician liaison uh, with the healthcare and life sciences team. And so really it's just, uh, or you could say technology physician, or, or if you're a nurse, you know, uh, or if you're, I, I know people at AWS who are nurses, who are dietitians, who are social workers. Uh, it's really about wanting to see what you do or what you want to do uh, and, and trying to decide which direction you want to head, but in the end, Every tech company is looking for uh, healthcare expertise because it's a huge market. It's a huge opportunity, both financially um, and from an outcome standpoint. There's a lot that I think we can learn from tech uh, and, and that we can use to try to improve our healthcare system. Any other questions that are on the, on the chat? Yeah. The obstacles that you mentioned that aren't really solvable with codes, basically. Mm -hmm. The financial obstacles, like the personnel obstacles. Mm -hmm. Is there groups and companies making an effort to fix that problem on the, on the floor level? Because most of the time, the most understaffing you see is on the lowest totem pole within healthcare. Yeah. You. AWS is not going to find more MAs for an otolaryngology clinic. Uh, but I'll give you an, uh, 
uh, an interesting story. Right before I left Seattle Children's, I was gonna I decided I was gonna go shadow one of the uh, ENT surgeons. So I went to his clinic, and I remember sitting in the waiting room, not in the waiting, in the team room, and I'd been watching him going in and out of rooms and looking over his shoulder to see how he was using the electronic health record. And about an hour and a half in, uh, we were sitting in the room, and the medical assistant came in and said, so-and-so patient that just called, they can't come today. They're, they're a no-show. And so they said, well, okay, well, what are we going to do with the schedule then? Because we now have an opening, and, and I'm not joking, this is 2019. They walked up to the whiteboard, which is this big grid with a bunch of colored magnets, and started moving magnets around by their, with their hands. Said, well, you know, if this patient is show up, we can move this one to this room, and then uh, we have an opening here, and, and this physician's here, and then we can move their lunch up to here. They're doing it with magnets in 2019. So I think, it's, you know, similarly, when I, when I spent eight years, eight years, 11 years at Children's Hospital of Minnesota, in those 11 years, uh, I worked in a pediatric critical care unit that was 16 beds at the smallest, 25 beds at the biggest, uh, with no residents, no fellows, no medical students, no nurse practitioners, no PAs. It was just me. And I got really, really efficient at doing certain things. And I remember my first day at Seattle Children's, I walk up to the PICU to start rounds, and I see two medical students, four residents, three fellows, a nurse practitioner, um, and a few other people. So we're sitting on rounds with, no joke, like 15 people, and thinking, right now, our patient-to-physician ratio is two to one. Now, obviously, it's a teaching hospital, so you need to have um, people there who you're teaching. But I, what I found over my time at Seattle Children's was the number of people we had almost pushed us towards inefficiency. It pushed us towards duplication of work. It pushed us towards um, doing things that were really of little value, despite being a really heavy-duty lean organization. So I think when we think about you know, the staffing problems, uh, there are certainly technologies out there, robotic process automation, um, optical character recognition, all these things uh, that we can do to ease the work that people do. But what it doesn't do, and I'll actually talk about this in, I think it's my second to the last slide, is it doesn't really get to that sort of um, the human factors of, of asking, should they really be doing that? Is that really a value? Uh, you know, can somebody else be doing that? Uh, are they working at the top of their license? All those questions, tech can't fix. So let me walk through one example of something that we're doing with a couple of places, uh, and, then I'll, and then I'll wrap up. I left uh, Seattle Children's in 2021, and I happened to be talking, I was having dinner with a few people, and I was talking to one of the nephrologists. And she is, at Seattle Children's, the site head <clears throat> of this program called Ninja. And Ninja is a, a multi-organization group whose aim is to reduce kidney injury from medications. <clears throat> and so her job is to essentially track any patient at Seattle Children's who uh, gets exposed to this list of 57 different medications that are considered nephrotoxic, uh, track which ones are exposed, tra track which ones have changes in their creatinine as a result of it, uh, track when their creatinine changes, by how much, when they go back down, um, and then every month she sends a little report to this group uh, that says, this month we had 17 patients uh, go into AKI, we had 110 exposed, uh, and we had a total of 1,700 patients, whatever it might be. So she does all this manually. And she was frustrated because there was a lot of manual work, uh, and it wasn't quite reaching the original goal of this group. So I told her to grab a couple of friends uh, from other institutions, and let's just have a conversation. So all it cost them was an hour of their time. So we brought somebody from Boston, somebody from Stanford, and somebody from Seattle, and we started talking. And what we found was they're all over the place. 
One of them had this beautiful Tableau dashboard uh, for this, but it was, uh, wasn't filterable to everything that he wanted. Uh, and it was, uh, he had to go back and ask for more things. Another one had another Tableau dashboard, but it wasn't automated. She had to pull it manually or ask for it to be pulled. And then the third one was getting Excel spreadsheets in an email every morning and had to do his own pivot tables and things like that. And so we asked them, well, what does this look like? Let's work backwards from what the ideal is. And they said, well, we're actually a pretty easy group. All we're pulling is medications and creatinines. That's it. And we just want to be able to track this data easily and report it easily. So they told us that. Uh, I sat down with one of our solution architects, and we used this publicly available data set that, that uh, we have access to. And in about two weeks, he built this. Uh, this is electronic health record agnostic that essentially shows how many patients do you have, how many patients developed acute kidney injury, how many got exposed, where did they come from, what are their diagnoses. Uh, the word cloud is really cool. It's useless, but it's really cool. It, it sort of makes a cool impact. They can't do anything with it. Um, and so they looked at that and said, that's amazing. Get rid of that. Um, but he did this in two weeks uh, with, with really no investment. And then at the single patient level, he's able to show them, uh, here's what happened to the patient's creatinine. Here's the medications that they were given and, and the times that they were given. Here's where they were. In this case, ICU patients don't count, so they have to show where that is. And the cool thing is, could any analyst do this in Epic or Cerner? Absolutely. But the point is, we have 14 different institutions here. So if you multiply the, the analysts doing this at 14 different institutions in two or three or four different like, electronic health records, that's just silly, wasteful time of people's expertise. Whereas if he can build this in a completely EHR agnostic way, and we can go to all 14 sites and say, you sort of agree that this is a, a good, good start. Uh, we can show you how to plug it into your electronic health record so that every morning you come in and you see this. And if you want more information, you go down to the bottom. What you don't see down here is the, the actual patients. And you click on that patient and you see this. Especially the, the, the guy at Boston, his eyes lit up and said, I want this. Um, and I can only imagine that a lot of people might want this. And this is the kind of thing that we do. The really cool stuff about this is Right now, every month, they submit these five data points, these rates. We had X number of patients. This percent of patients got exposed. This percent of patients developed acute kidney injury. And all they can do with that is say, you did better this month. You did worse this month. The original intent of this was to truly reduce acute kidney injury. And when you really push them and say, so you've got this list of 57 different medications. Where'd that come from? And they sort of sheepishly go, well, there's some data out there. Some of them are case reports. Some of them are expert opinion. Some of them make sense physiologically, but there's really no data. So what they want to do is actually combine all their data and get real information on, does the combination of vancomycin and zosin along with uh, dehydration and you know, a low hemoglobin actually cause increase in acute kidney injury? We don't know. But what they want to do is this thing, which is called federated learning. So take a, a uh, data set, create a machine learning model, and with that, then apply that to each of these different data sets. So you can see along the bottom, imagine those three are the three different sites. They're not actually sharing their data with the central server because they're worried about sharing data with other places, HIPAA, GDPR, and just privacy as a, as a whole. But what it does is it trains on their data, and then their, their model sends back the insights to the central model, but not the data. And with this, not only will they keep their data secure, but all of a sudden they went from having a relatively small data set at Seattle Children's or at Boston to this 14 institution data set that might actually be big enough to generate some insights uh, for this problem. And this applies to this problem, it applies to almost anything. Uh, and as I look at one of the things that we really want to do for next year is try to be that enabler to encourage sites to securely uh, but freely share data. Hel you know, when we think about machine learning uh, and the, the, the really cool machine learning models outside of healthcare, the data sets are huge. Healthcare data sets by comparison are pretty tiny unless we start sharing. Uh, and we haven't figured out a way to do that very well yet. There are certainly... Uh, areas within the electronic health record communities and then uh, other sort of separate uh, areas that are data sharing, but a lot of it is still very manual or very limited. 
So we're hoping to start enabling that uh, a little bit more. And really, <clears throat> when you look at artificial intelligence and machine learning, I think it's been put on this pedestal, this expectation that it's going to solve everything in healthcare. And, and I don't think that's true. Are there places where this can absolutely help, help, help healthcare? Definitely. Uh, we've seen a lot of examples, but we've seen them in little pockets in isolation. What we're hoping is that we can use it to augment humans, not replace humans. And I think that combination of the technology and the humans is where we're going to really make the difference. And I talked a little bit about uh, the, at the institution level. This is sort of where I see the sweet spot in, in healthcare as a whole. We talk a lot about precision medicine, especially, you know, lab medicine is one place where we talk a lot about genomics and precision medicine. And precision medicine is super important. You know, we want to treat somebody's cancer based on their genetic profile and their susceptibility to the chemotherapy. But that's not going to move the needle at a, at, at a country level or at a system level. At the same time, pop health is great, uh, but it is pretty impersonal. Uh, when, when I was uh, in my second year of fellowship, and I went and climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, and I got back from Kilimanjaro. I don't remember why, but I got my hemoglobin tested, and I had hemoglobin of 19 when I got back from Kilimanjaro. Uh, population health says that I should be dead, uh, and, and, and it completely ignored the fact that, that I was a healthy 25-year-old who had just gone up to 19,000 feet. But Pop Health says that's abnormal. And so how do we combine pop health and precision medicine, but at the same time acknowledge all of the human factors in healthcare that are either making things easier or harder? So I think if we can get to that center sweet spot, uh, that's where I think we're going to make a big difference. So I'm going to talk about a couple of little projects that we're doing just to give you an idea. I mentioned the patient safety reports. We're looking at artificial intelligence to translate notes. You know, with the advent of electronic health record portals and things like that, we're sending all this information to patients, uh, and it's both medically complex and not potentially in their own language. So can we use this to translate things, uh, medical documents? The uh, using machine learning to improve medication safety is a project that actually started at Seattle Children's before I left, uh, where we're identifying medication errors on the discharge medication list. And, and when we think about, you know, digital, we talked a little bit about digital pathology at the beginning. Uh, you know, lab normals, is there a way to tailor a normal lab to the patient rather than just saying, yeah, you know, normal creatinine for a, for a patient is 0.8 to 1.2. That is so, so blunt. Uh, but that's what we do in healthcare. We use these normals and then the patients get it on their lab report and, oh, I'm 1.3, that something's got to be wrong. Well, you know, we didn't take into consideration the, the, the fact that you're this or this or this. That's, that's a, that'd be a cool project. What other things, I mean, it really, when we talk about working backwards, it really is not for us to decide what to work on. It's really for, for you to decide uh, what to work on. So I'm going to talk about one last thing, and then I'll, I'll close up. Does anybody recognize this guy? He's got kind of a, a nondescript face, kind of grumpy looking. So this is Sir David Brailsford. Uh, he, I don't remember what he was knighted for, but... <clears throat> About uh, 15 years ago, he was made head of the British Cycling Federation. Historically, uh, British Cycling had done pretty well on the track, but they hadn't done anything uh, in professional road racing. Uh, they hadn't really won any races. The thing that, the, that British Cycling was most well known for, actually, in the Tour de France, was that a guy named Tom Simpson died in the Tour de France in the 1960s, and there's actually a, a big uh, tomb uh, to him at this mountain in France. If you ever listen to the David Bowie song, Major Tom, it's about that guy um, uh, who, who died climbing a mountain because he was so up on drugs. He was like on cocaine and on amphetamines and things like that. But anyways, that's what British Cycling was known for. So they hired David Brailsford uh, and said, your job is to bring British Cycling up. And he used this concept of marginal gains. If you've ever read Atomic Habits, same sort of thing, marginal gains. So marginal gains, the principle is, if you can improve by 1% every day, by the end of the year, it's a 40% uh, difference. 40% is huge. We don't see 40% in healthcare, in anything. Um, I've seen 40% at Amazon in a lot of things. I haven't seen 40% in healthcare. But if we could say, we're going to you know, improve our accuracy by 40%, we're going to improve our capacity by 40%, we're going to reduce our errors by 40%, that's huge. So how did he do this? Uh, he decided that he was going to put air filters in the uh, buses 
so that they would breathe less dust at night when they're sleeping. He decided that he would uh, put a mesh on their uh, jerseys to make them a little bit cooler on hot days. He uh, tweaked their helmets a little bit to make just a little bit more aerodynamic, uh, their helmets. Uh, and he did hundreds of these, hundreds of these little tiny, tiny things. If he, and he just wanted like a half percent or one percent improvement. And what happened? Six out of seven years, they won the Tour de France with three different people. Uh, and they went from nothing to, they, to dominating the sport uh, because of this concept of marginal gains. I think marginal gains is something that we can look at in healthcare and say, if we can just improve by 1% a day or 5% a month, uh, and it may not completely solve our staffing problems or it may not completely solve the financial problems, but little by little, I think we can do that. And that's sort of what I do on a daily basis is I sit down with somebody and say, let's look at what problem you're, you're uh, having or what you want to address. Let's just figure out a proof of concept on how we might do that and, and see if it works. And if it does, great. If it doesn't, let's move on to the next thing. So with that, I'm going to stop and see if there are any questions. The evaluation uh, and the, uh, uh, the QR code is here. What questions can I answer? Yeah. Thanks a lot. It was great. Re really interesting to hear, hear that perspective. So I mean, we could probably talk for a really long time about mm -hmm. incentives and disincentives yeah. for health care informatics, right? Mm -hmm. DHR vendors and institutions. It's, I mean, as you know, it's really, really hard to change anything. It's really, really hard to get systems to work together. Mm -hmm. What do you see AWS's relationship, uh, how does AWS view its relationship with EHR vendors? Yeah. And, and how do EHR vendors view AWS? Are you partners? Are you competitors? And I, I guess part B is, do you think that EHR vendors are really entering into the whole conversation about interoperability in good faith? Because I, I see that, you know, your example of your shipping data off to have a model run and then ship the results back. That all depends on interoperability and historically it's been very challenging to get EHR vendors on board. So just some yeah. thoughts on those topics. Yeah, you're right. It's, a, it's, it's, it's probably a, a multi-hour conversation. You know, are, we, are we competitors of EHRs? Are we um, <clears throat> uh, partners? Kind of depends on the EHR. Uh, a great example. Right now, the population health platform uh, of Cerner is built on AWS, despite the fact that they are now owned by one of our competitors, Oracle. So unwrap that. Um, you know, Epic, uh, we actually work pretty closely with Epic. We actually host. Uh, if you want to host your instance of Epic on AWS, you can. That's sort of at the big sort of infrastructure level. But at the, at the deeper level, the way we're not, we're not in the market to be in EHR. But certainly what we are talking about a lot is the concept that the EHR is only one data point, one data set. When it comes to a patient, it's a limited data set. We're, the EHR, at least right now, ignores a lot of the social determinants. It ignores their life outside of the healthcare system. Or even if you don't have interoperability, uh, it ignores the, the non-institutions EHR. Uh, so I think where we're seeing this is uh, filling those gaps in or supplementing the EHR, building on top of the EHR data to try to really put the patient or the clinician at the center. We have a pretty good relationship with the EHRs, whether it be directly at our leadership levels or, uh, you know, fortunately there are some technologies. We have HL7, we have FHIR, all these ways that we can extract data out of the EHR that is relatively universal. And we're going to, I think, see that more and more where we're going to uh, really use what's in the EHR, do some cool stuff, and then put it back in the EHR. That's really the goal is to, like you said, um, take data out of there, pull multiple data streams, uh, and then do, whether it be doing a model or doing a dashboard or whatever, and then putting it back in front of the clinicians. I had a geneticist uh, from Texas say, we want to know better which patients should undergo genetic testing. Because right now it's kind of up to the whim of the, the clinician. So she wants to pull in data from uh, genomics, from lab, from clinical notes, uh, and try to better inform and create decision support for the clinicians that, where if they see something, uh, they get better information. That's a great example of 
you're pulling it in from a bunch of different places. Maybe you're pulling in geographical data. Maybe you're pulling in um, uh, weather data. Maybe you're pulling in all these other things, supplementing that with the EHR uh, and doing something with it. So I think the concept of multimodal data is where we're headed. And the EHR is one of those modes, but not all of them. Yeah. Mark Weiner asks, do you have international data in perspective or ways to improve efficiency is in ways to improve efficiencies in the US? Yes. Uh, you know, AWS Healthcare, I work for AWS Healthcare within academic medicine in the United States. We have an equivalent group that uh, does academic medicine in Europe and in South America. They have very different projects than we do because the models are different and the, the, uh, the perspectives are different. Certainly, the need for uh, improving efficiency, reducing burnout, those are all there. But some of the, the, the things that influence what we do are totally different in Europe versus South America. But even when I sit down and, and a few months ago, I had the chance to speak to a group of hospitals from Peru. And I presented this project where we proposed to use uh, multiple data sets, financial data, supply chain data, lab data, imaging data, uh, physician professional feed data to determine the true, true cost of care by a diagnosis. So you could go into a, a hospital and say, uh, to do a knee replacement surgery, it should cost exactly this much. And here's the variation across the, the surgeons. They were really interested in that. They're a very different healthcare system than we are, but they were still interested in that because their goal is still the same, to improve the outcomes and reduce the cost. So I think the quadruple aim is pretty universal. Yeah. Uh, so you were mentioning earlier a little bit about uh, you know, some of the issues with trying to universalize some of these machine learning algorithms mm -hmm. and yeah. you know, making sure that they are not missing out on a bunch of patients. Uh, and I know that very frequently we see that the patients that do get missed out on by these errant algorithms are uh, people of color, women, you know, like minorities. And so what I wanted to ask is what do you see as the role of AWS and the services that you provide in deconstructing some of that underlying uh, inequalities and racism and stuff in the medical system, and how can we keep some of those inequalities out of the uh, new kind of machine learning algorithms and things that we're building to make healthcare more efficient and more accessible to all? I think I'll, uh, I'll answer that question quickly and threefold. One is, the technology itself, what we've built into our uh, solutions is the ability to identify bias, identify drift, identify changes over time with the changes in the data set. So there are some technologies that we've built to try to identify uh, aspects of a model that may not uh, treat every patient equally. Uh, the second piece is <clears throat> um, just purely from a knowledge standpoint, when I work with uh, customers to build a machine learning model, a lot of the advising that goes on in there is to make sure that the data sets that you're using are actually representative of the, pip of the population that you're going to uh, that you're going to be treating. Making sure that uh, when you build a model to uh, detect uh, something on a chest X-ray, that it's not simply detecting the L uh, on the on the X-ray to determine whether they're upright or laying down. You know those kinds of things. And then the third one is uh, AWS as a whole has a huge stake in improving health equity. We have a, actually a, a $30 million grant program that is helping fund projects that address health equity. And so uh, whether it be uh, one of the projects that we're looking at is improving access to uh, eye care or uh, routine eye exams in uh, downtown Philadelphia. Uh, or using, actually, one of the companies that spun out of Seattle Children's that is built on AWS, they got funded for the health equity program. They did a cool study here at UW where they looked at the difference in uh, stroke care within the UW ED uh, across racial groups. Uh, and they were able to address it by getting data out of this. So I think it's a, sort of a multi, uh, multi part answer. Um, but it's something that is certainly in everybody's mind. And actually, we have a couple of 
places that we're working with who have projects specifically aimed at that. They're, they're using federated learning to uh, address disinformation in the media and things like that. So it's kind of a multi, multiple part answer, but it's on everybody's mind because we've seen so many instances where you build a model, you think it's really good, you apply it to a new patient population and it's useless. So I know we're a little past 4.30. Um, any other questions? I'm also happy to stay afterwards. Online, there's a question about HIPAA being challenging for patient data sharing, and what is your take on it? We may have already answered that about federated data sharing. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's different things that we can do for data sharing. One is uh, we can de-identify it. Uh, and a lot of what we do, a lot of the models that we built actually don't need any of the 18 safe harbor identifiers. Um, on the other hand, there are certain... Uh, for example, there's collaboratives that we're working that are IRB approved, where the patients have already consented to getting their data shared. So there's a couple of different ways to address it. The biggest thing that we certainly do is just to try to de-identify the data ahead of time. We have this tool that is exclusively designed to de-identify the data so that we can get the important information out of there but not have it be uh, a risk. Certainly as we start moving into areas like genomics, it's going to get a lot more complicated. Um, and there are some who argue that there is no true de-identification of data. You have enough steps backwards, you can probably identify somebody. Uh, but that's what we do to start. Thank you. All right, well, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I'll, I'll stick around.